Greetings. Today we take up Adam Smith, considered by many to be the founder of modern economics. First, we take a look at the philosophical background of Adam Smith. Certainly, the Enlightenment in Europe is often considered to be a great, if not the greatest, turning point in human understanding and civilization by many writers, and Adam Smith was in the center of this. These 17th and 18th century philosophers uh, really became much bolder in their assertion of a new way of thinking about the world. They rejected a lot of the narrow vision and the church dogmas of the past. Instead, they began to look for uh, a, a more scientific way of understanding the world and intellectual life. Of course, Newton's discovery of uh, the laws of physics uh, was a powerful revelation of our potential as a human race for understanding the world. Uh, but even in theological areas, uh, notions were changed in the way people thought about things. In the past, God had been thought of as a perpetual intervener in and controller of human affairs. Uh, always there, always in intervening, always responding to prayer, always making things happen, either for better or for worse. Uh, but instead, we now began to have a concept of God as a creator of a world that had its own internal logic and rational physical laws. These, of course, had been determined by God in this view, but God was no longer actively engaged in affecting day-to-day -day affairs. Rather, it was the world itself with its own logical or rational physical laws. The Enlightenment, uh, as we continue on that, we find that uh, philosophers actually went from this idea that the physical laws were discoverable and had their own internal uh, dynamic. Uh, we went from that to thinking about the possibility that there might be similar laws about the social world, including its economic dimension. John Locke is probably the most famous uh, person in the evolution of this thinking, who actually had a much more of a research or an empiricist orientation to actually understand what the laws of the social world might be. And so we eventually have these, uh, the uh, relatively sterile, purely deductive Christian rational school of thought being supplanted by a much more uh, dynamic and optimistic uh, philosophy. Uh, Christian rationalist thought had started from first principles. You make a set of assumptions about God and the world. And then you, from those assumptions, you deduce all of the knowledge and principles. This is really the essence of metaphysics. And metaphysics was something that was being rejected by the research or empiricist type. Uh, philosopher. And so we were looking then as a uh, human race in, in, in Europe at uh, ways to understand the objective or prescribed laws of human society. You see, they were very optimistic. We first of all discovered a, a, the laws of physics and that we can actually control some aspects of nature. Maybe we can control ourselves. Intellectuals were thrilled with the notion that maybe we were on the verge of discovering the rules of nature as applied to humanity. This would include an ideal moral code. Somehow that had that could be deduced or understood from studying the world. They also believe that humanity, in addition to being able to find this ideal moral code, had enough potential for rationality and reasonableness that they could actually act on this moral code. So this the promulgation of these laws, these laws that are deduced by these Enlightenment philosophers, would actually then, if implemented and carried out by people, lead to a world of civil relations. People could follow their natural desires and their social rationality combined with their understanding of the physical laws of nature would lead to a fully satisfying life for all humanity. Uh, we would have individual liberty and good critical analytical thinking for everyone. So we begin to have a new way of thinking about natural law. Remember this, the natural law of the scholastics of the medieval period posited that everything was God's property, but there was a humanity uh, in charge of this as the custodian, and yet humanity was flawed as a result of original sin, uh, Adam and Eve, and so on. So that meant that you needed positive law to operationalize the ability of humanity's uh, conservatorship of God's property to work. Positive law, remember, included the right to private property, but this is a different kind of private property from the private property we may think of today because the purpose of the right to private property was to guarantee the benefits of God's bounty for all humanity. Property owners were, in principle, stewards of their property for the benefit of all humanity. Now, I would not say that the, that the property owners of the medieval period uh, actually acted this way. Uh, 
don't really think they really were stewards of their property for the benefit of all humanity. But they did have this idea, certainly within the uh, philosophy of the period. Instead, with the, nat the new natural law in the, in the Enlightenment, we, we have instead rights and responsibilities or rights and reciprocal duties among all people. And the nat this natural law then is aimed at maximizing the personal liberty of each member of society, and it even has the right to overthrow governments that obstruct this search for the uh, rights and reciprocal duties that will maximize the personal liberty of each person. The natural law of the Enlightenment has this viewpoint that people came together from a state of nature to form a society with rights and responsibilities towards each other. And that that was really what was the right way to do things. These people would cooperate with each other, they could compete with each other as each tried to meet their natural desires uh, through human interaction. And out of this, we would end up with uh, a much better world. And in fact, mainstream enlightenment thinking evolved into the give and take of liberal democracy and politics, and even justified the give and take of the free market in economics. A lot of this can be found in John Locke, uh, his two treatises on government, the uh, second treatise in chapter two, for a good discussion of, of, of this. And so we then come to Adam Smith and the Scottish version of the Enlightenment. He wrote in the midst of this period, he was a big developer of Enlightenment views, and his intellectual lineage goes from Locke to Shaftesbury to Hutchison, who was his teacher at the University of Glasgow. He actually uh, succeeded uh, Hutchison to the uh, chair in philosophy at Glasgow. There were many other figures that uh, influenced Smith uh, in his own work. Uh, Thomas Hobbes, of course, is famous for his contrary view to that of Locke. Uh, Bernard de Mandeville is important for his cynical view about human nature. David Hume, on the other hand, is very optimistic. And Henry Moore is also uh, another player who had some role in influencing his thinking. But when you come right down to it, the core of the Scottish Enlightenment was David Hume, Adam Smith, and his teacher, Francis Hutcheson. And this Scottish Enlightenment represented a break with scholasticism similar to that of other Enlightenment thinkers. And with that, we will move to preparation for class. I'd encourage you to continue to read the lecture notes and to prepare for class. Take care now.